So before we get into the message, let's uh, have a word of prayer. And uh, just you pray for me as I try to bring what God has laid on my heart. And I will pray the Holy Spirit has total dominance. And together, we will have a great worship service. Father God, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to speak from your holy word. Lord, I ask you would bless your people and challenge us. Lord, I ask that your words would come alive and we would just be so blessed by being in your house tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. And it's in your holy and precious name that I pray. Amen. Last message I had the opportunity to preach here was not one that I really enjoyed bringing. Most people didn't really enjoy hearing it. I actually had a lady came out and said, that certainly wasn't very uplifting. And she was right. I agreed with her 100%. Message this week, I'm so much happier God laid on my heart. It has to do with one of my favorite verses of the Bible. I have a lot of favorite verses, by the way. You probably do too if you've been in the Bible very long. Um, I started to enumerate a bunch of them, but they're verses that I take to heart, and I'm sure you have, and I pray that you would continue to look for and read the Word and find verses that speak to your heart and really say something to you. So I want to get to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10. That's a subject that really has permeated my life in the last few years. So let me just read those verses to you. By the way, I was told last time that when I gave you a verse, I went too fast. I didn't give you time to find it. Amen. So I am going to try to leave a little time, mention it more than once. I don't want to leave anybody out. So we're in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And those of you that know me know that I uh, read mostly from the King James Version of the Bible. And you will have to forgive me and love me anyway because I'm old and I can get away with it. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. May God bless his holy word. We hear a lot about grace. And we hear grace used to allow us to get away with or at least think we can get away with many things. I, I've heard people say, well, I'm under the grace of God, so whatever I do is all right. He's going to forgive me, and, and I, I, I don't have to worry too much about my situation. Yeah, He will forgive you, but His grace doesn't allow us or give us liberty to just go about living in sin and doing what we want to do, and being propelled and controlled by the flesh. We need to understand that. The, the Greek word is uh, charis, which means, and the meaning usually given is unmerited favor. Usually if you ask most Christians, what do you, how would you define grace? They'll tell you unmerited favor. Getting what we don't deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. Justice is getting what we really deserve. Thank God for His grace. But you know, it's a whole lot more than that. It is much more than including favor, but it includes the goodwill. Grace includes the goodwill of God. Benefits. Grace includes the benefits of God. Grace allows us to be grateful, appreciative, and thankful. Grace needs to be an attitude, guys. And that attitude needs to permeate everything we are, everything we do, everything we think about, everything, all of our actions, all of our attitudes, all needs to be permeated by grace. If, it, if we would get there, if we would get there to where grace was our motivating factor, because 
Grace is what motivated God to bring us to this point. Imagine how nice that would be. Years ago, we were in motorcycle ministry, and we walked into this restaurant, and there was probably about 20 of us, and the poor little lady who was the server was absolutely overwhelmed. And we began to order, and she messed up every order there was. And the food came out, and they had done just about everything wrong they could do to the food. And not only had they messed everything up, but it took about three times as long as you would expect to in any restaurant. And thankfully, the people we were with were willing to exhibit grace. Because we went through that whole evening, nobody got frustrated, nobody got angry. You know, when you, when you got a cup of coffee and they give you free refills, and you went through the first cup, and 30 minutes later, it's still sitting there empty. You, 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 gotta, you could have a gripe. But we got through the evening, actually left the lady a tip. And you know, if you're a Christian, you ought to do that. Actually left the lady a tip. And on our way out, the manager stopped us. And he said to one of our members, I don't understand because you guys certainly have not gotten the service that we expect our customers to get in here tonight, but you've been really easy to deal with and you haven't complained. And our member said, and this is where I think we all need to be, he said, you know, we're shown grace, therefore we must show grace. I thought that was a really good illustration of where we need to be. Grace has to permeate every attitude we have. You see, grace in our lives ushers in peace and mercy. And as I go through this message tonight, don't, don't get the idea that grace hides everything and so we don't have to do anything. Incorrect. Incorrect. Grace just allows us to act Christ-like. So as Brother Paul writes this, he says, by grace we are saved. Saved, redeemed with a price. John, 1 John 2, 2. Did y'all get that? 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 tells us that Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation simply means he was the perfect, acceptable sacrifice to pay our sin debt. Jesus paid it all. He is the only acceptable sacrifice for the sins of the world. There is so much in that one little line in the Bible. For grace, God's grace, we have been saved. I hear people tell me all the time, well, I can get saved whenever I want. Well, let's go on. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Faith involves a knowledge of the gospel. Romans 10, 14. An acknowledgement of the truth of its message. and a personal reception of the Savior. So there's more elements to, great, to faith than just going, I believe. We must have a knowledge of the gospel. At some point, someone needs to have shared God's word with the lost. And when we've done that, <clears throat> that person needs to come to a point of acknowledgement, this is true. I believe this but it's, a, it's much, much more than just the acknowledgement of the truth of the gospel. It's even much more than belief of the gospel. I want to take you to another, another verse. 
that I think really speaks to this. And it's John, the Gospel of John, <coughs> excuse me, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And I'll go into verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You see, to really understand what it means to be saved, we have to understand the rebirth that comes through the belief in Jesus Christ. We have to understand there is a spiritual birth that people have to come to know about and then personally receive. Personally receive. It says that you are given, you, by grace you're saved through faith. Faith is an interesting thing to me because we must have so little of it. Do you realize that? You see, according to the word right here, the only thing that's able to bring us into salvation is faith. Matthew's gospel Chapter 17, verse 21. Jesus says, if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. If y'all remember a few weeks ago, Moses had on the board up there a, a video about how tiny a mustard seed really is. You can barely see it. It's almost infinitesimal. If you put it in your, in your hands, you could lose it in just a second. And Jesus said, if we have that kind of faith, just that much of a little bit of faith, we can say to the mountain, mountain, get up from there and go over there. And it would do it. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never had the mountain get up and walk. Anybody in this room ever had the mountain get up and walk? And raise your hand. I'd love to talk to you. But imagine if it takes, oh, just that little bit of faith to physically move a mountain. What must be that tiny spark of faith that brings us to Jesus Christ? Only the grace of God can give us that little tiny spark of faith that brings us to Jesus our Savior. Mustard seed, folks. We need to think about, we need to think about faith. We need to think about how, the fa how fa faith works with us. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. So, I didn't have enough faith to get saved. You didn't have enough faith to get saved. Only God working in our lives gave us the faith to come to the realization that we needed a Savior. Amen? Thank you. I appreciate that. Amen. It goes on. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You see, the gift of God comes through the movement of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. I could stand and preach 100,000 words. And if there was a lost person in the congregation and the Holy Spirit did not move that person, I've wasted 100,000 words. But... I could stand in front of a congregation, any pastor could, and speak maybe 10 words. And if the Holy Spirit was moving and, and directing a person, he would draw that person to him and to Jesus immediately. We need to be prayer. Guys, we need to be praying with such fervency that the Holy Spirit moves in every thing that we do at Revolution Church. We need to pray that the Holy Spirit is in every part of the ministry of Revolution Church. And if He is, it will be fantastic what is done. If you're still in John, go over a couple of chapters with me. 
By the way, I started this out and said that I uh, have a lot of favorite scriptures. I want you to know that John, the 15th, 16th, and 17th chapters are some of the scriptures that I love the most in God's Word. Listen to the work of the Holy Spirit. This is John 16. I'm going to start in verse 8. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. And then verse 13, and this is really, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. And then Jesus goes on. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. You see, the Holy Spirit comes speaking truth, pointing to Jesus, and says, I'll open your eyes, I'll show it to you. I'll open your spiritual eyes till you can understand your need, my need, the world's need for a Savior. It just doesn't get any better than that, guys. Verse 8 goes on. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 goes on. It is the gift of God. Without the gift of God, we can't muster enough faith to be saved. And let me tell you something. I don't know what you've heard and what, what doctrinally you come from and where you are as far as your uh, belief and how everything works, but let me just put it this way. When it says the gift of God, if it isn't a gift, it isn't the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? If it isn't freely given from the will of God and you receive it as a gift, nothing you can do for it, nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you can do to pay for it, just an absolute free gift of God. Anytime the gospel is presented in any manner than that, it's to be accursed. The presentation is to be accursed. If it's not a gift, it's not the gospel. We need to understand, guys, that God's grace is so magnificent that he brings us the gospel so we can understand it and we can enter into his salvation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Brings me to verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, works can mean trying to be a moral person, living with the law, trying to get good enough to be saved. It can be mean, it can mean, uh, excuse me, it can mean something as menial as doing what we do as to a vocation, like getting up and going to work every day. I hear people all the time say to me, well, when I get my life straightened up, I'm going to come to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fat chance. Not going to happen. If you're waiting to get good enough to come to the Lord, you're never going to get there. Because I got news for you. None of our getting good enough is good enough. Isaiah 64, 6 says our best works, the very best we can do, are as filthy rags are as filthy rags. When we think our good enough is truly good enough, we translate or we transfer the glory of God's salvation from God to us. And that's a scary place to be in, guys. If we begin to think that I can get good enough, I begin to think, if I just get good enough, God can save me and I can go forward from here and it will be wonderful. No, it won't. Because first place, how good is good enough? Is it good enough 
the fact that you don't break any laws, that's great. Is it good enough to know that you are moral in every dealing and aspect in your life? That's great. But listen to this. One, one evil thought. And we've done away with all that good. One, I hate my brother. And we've done away with everything good we've ever done. One, you blankety 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 blank who cut me off in traffic and I hate you because you've tried to kill me. We've done away with all that good. We'll never get good enough, guys. We will never get good enough. That's why the, the word says that we can't rely on our works. We can't rely on the good things that we do. And works doesn't have to be, you know, maybe you're that person that is in church every time the doors are open and you're painting the walls and you're sweeping the floors and you are just doing everything that's asked every moment of every hour of every day. That is a work. Maybe you're that person that the work is simply praying day in and day out for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Works covers a myriad of things. But we have to understand that not even, not even one of them, not even the best one, qualifies us for salvation. Only the grace of God by faith in Jesus Christ brings us there. Well, that's really nice until we look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. Some of the more modern versions say we are his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I looked up and worked on that word workmanship. And it actually, if you look at the dictionary definition, uh, it talks about being the pri proprietorship of the manufacturer. I thought, holy cow, what in the world does that mean? But when you reduce it down and look at it in the spiritual, it's that he who created us, he who created us, took ownership of us. And he, because he took ownership of us, we can do things that are good. He's we were created to do some things that are good. We were brought here to do things that our Christ has asked us to do. I hope you've got a Bible. If you don't, there's one in the pew and there's one on the table. If you, you can find a Bible because I really want you to look at this next verse with me. I would, I would suggest that you underline it. I would suggest that you commit it to memory because I'm going to read the verse and I'm going to ask you a question. The verse is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. And we're going to begin to talk about our callings and our doings and our attitudes. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says here, be, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Some versions say, be ye imitators of me. The question is this, are we worthy of being imitated? Would you like the people around you to imitate what you do on a daily basis? No. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for being truthful. When we all look, when we look at each other and we think about that, and I think about some things that happened and I've done in my life and the way I've reacted, would I want somebody to imitate me in that reaction? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But the word has just said, we're supposed to be followers, imitators. We're supposed to be doing Christ-like things in our lives. We are supposed to be, 
you know, and it's not like we have to do it on our own. Understand that. It's not, this is not something we have to do out there on our own. We're not, uh, we're not to be lone ranger Christians. We're not to be out there try, trying to do everything on our own strength. Because what does it say here? We were created in Christ. By the way, you might want to underline that in Christ. Because guys, we need to be so cognizant of us being in Christ and Christ being in us. We need to see that. We need to know that daily. Created in Christ unto good works. You notice that he put this statement after verse 9 because he wanted to put works in proper perspective. But he tells us those good works, the works we're talking about here, God has ordained before that we should walk in them. So when did God ordain the good works that you and I should do? Before the foundation of the world. God knew, what you, God knew when you were going to be on this planet. God knew what you were going to be facing. God knew what you were going to be doing. God knew whether you were going to be obedient or disobedient. And God set works before every one of us, ministries before every one of us, that we should follow in. Amen? I started out about, about how grace was give us so much leeway. And it does and it will. But we have to look at our motivation because of what God has done for us. We have to understand that God brought us to this point and motivates us to do the things that we do because He has ordained them. He set them in motion before the world even began. He knew where we were going to be. He knew what we were going to do. And he knew that we were going to make choices. We were going to be obedient and blessed or disobedient and not going to have the blessings that we should have. My prayer is that in these three verses, we can come to the point where we can live every day knowing that we are saved by the grace of God, knowing that the only thing that brought us there was faith, knowing we could never get good enough, we could never be good enough, we could never do things good enough, but also knowing that because we are where we are, we're allowed to do great works that bless God the Father. Amen? I want you to know a couple of things and I'm not going to keep you very long tonight. But as you go through this, and I hope, I hope you go through this, I hope you do a little reading. And, and in this chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 gives three reasons why God desires to save us. Do you know God desires to save us? He wants us. Well, Three reasons why he, decides to, why he desires to save us. Number one was to show his love. God desires to save every human being because he wants to show them his love. What that unconditional agape, I love you. I love you no matter what baggage you bring to me. I love you enough to have sent my son to die a horrible death on a cross because I want you with me. God loves, you know, God loves us enough to want us with him in paradise forever. Wow. When we stop and really bring that in, when we stop and really grow in that and realize that God loves us enough to want us to spend eternity in paradise with him. <clears throat> Just doesn't get any better than that. Just doesn't get any better than that. So the first thing God desires us to save, or the reason God desires to, us to be saved, He wants to show us His love. Secondly, He wants to show us His grace. He's just said, I'm going to give you the grace. 
I'm going to give you what you don't deserve instead of what you do deserve. Think about your life. You ever done anything that deserves punishment? Amen. We're all in that boat, guys. We're all right there. And God says, I love you so much that I sent my son to die on a cross to pay your debt. And I saved you for all of eternity because I love you and because I want to demonstrate grace. I want to be the epitome of grace. I want to be the action of grace. I want to digress just a minute. God is all that, what I've just talked about. Please never, ever get the idea that grace allows us to be disobedient to God's word. Never get that idea. God's word never teaches that. Verse after verse, chapter after chapter, word after word, God tells us, Obedience will result in blessings. Disobedience will result in real troubles. I want to give you grace, but I will not give you grace at any cost. In other words, I can't habitually, and this is kind of going back to the other message I, I preached, I can't habitually, regularly, without remorse, continue to live in a sinful condition and expect God to bless me. Matter of fact, I would even go so far as to say if I'm living in that condition, I may have never really have been saved. If I'm going down that road and I keep going down that road and I can do it without any type of remorse, any type of conviction, or any type of saying, wow, I need to change this. I need to check where I stand in my salvation experience. And the third thing I think God wants to demonstrate, he wants to show his workmanship by our good works. Did you get that? He wants to show that we are his creation we are his uh, proprietorship, and we prove that by what he allows us to do. Brother James, you remember? I really wasn't going to go here, but Brother James really breaks it down. Probably go here because this is Marty's favorite, favorite, favorite book of the Bible. James chapter 2 all the way to the end of that chapter, from verse 14 to the end. What does it profit, my brethren, if a man say he has faith and does not have works, can faith save him? And it goes on about if, if someone is naked, if someone needs food, if someone is being uh, in any kind of problems, that we, through our works, prove the glory and the grace of God. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 18. Yea, a man say, thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show you my faith by my works. Have you ever had anybody ever tell you, all I got to do is believe? I just believe what... I just believe in Jesus and I'm, I'll be good. That's all I got to do. I just confess Jesus as, as uh, the Savior of the world and I'm good, right? Question we asked the other day. Can you believe and not be saved? Mm, I'm getting yes, no, maybe. Uh. Verse 19 of James chapter 2. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou dost well. The devils also believe and tremble. And guys, they're not saved. The demons believe. So we need to understand that, as I said earlier, 
Belief will result in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing him personally. And as I close, I'd like to chase down a rabbit trail a little bit, I think. And I pray you guys will give me the grace to do this. I enjoy kicking over sacred cows. Mmm, yeah. I have been in churches and heard this. I have been in churches and uttered this. Thank God I've been able to go back to some of those churches and say, you know, I said this, and you really need to hear it in a different light. Have you ever said, heard this or said this? Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Anybody ever heard that? First thing, we don't make Jesus anything. We need to understand that. Who's lost? We were. We didn't force Jesus into anything. We don't make him jump through any hoops. We accept him. And we accept him as the only answer that we can possibly have. The only answer that we need. Secondly, there's a term out called Lordship Salvation, where you make Jesus Lord of your life, yada, yada, yada. I would submit to you, if he's not your Savior first, he will never be your Lord. Because we don't, we grow into Lordship. We don't accept Lordship usually at the moment of salvation. We begin to grow where God wants us to go. Amen? Haven't you grown spiritually since you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. Are you the same person the day you finally said, Jesus, I need you. I understand that you are the one and only Son of God. I accept you as my Savior. Did you not change and begin to grow from that moment on? If you didn't, there's a problem. Because God will at that moment begin to change and mold and make you and, begin, and have you be something else. So you make, we don't make Jesus, we accept Jesus. We accept Jesus as our Savior and we invite Him to be our Lord. Well, that was a good place to say amen. Nobody even mumbled at all. But I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. And like I say, I have made that self-same statement from pulpits until Jesus really convicted me is number one you don't make me do anything number two you have to recognize me as savior and number three I will lead you into lordship guys I pray that's where you are tonight I pray that Jesus Christ is your savior and your lord I pray that he is in charge of everything that you are doing every day. I pray that he's in charge of everything that I am doing every day. Now, if I'm going to be honest and confess to you, that's not exactly true. If you're going to be honest and confess to me, you're going to tell me the same thing. I'm striving. Amen? Aren't we all striving to get where, he, where he's called us to be? Don't we all really want him to be the Lord of our lives? Don't we want him to have total and complete control? Yes, we do. Does he? No. no. Well, there was a, a song years ago that uh, Marty will remember. You, I may be old enough to wear it. The rest of you don't remember it. But he's still working on me. Make me what I ought to be. What's the rest of it? Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me. You know what, guys? He's still working on me. He's still working on you. So let's give each other grace to grow in him. And let's go to the point where we realize that none of us are the completed article yet. None of us are where we need to be. But if we go right back to this verse, by the grace of God, we are saved through the faith that the Holy Spirit allows us to experience. 
We can't get good enough to get there. But because we are His workmanship and because He has ordained the life and the service that we need to be following, we're going to be able to walk in that situation. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that... Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for blessing. Lord, I know most of the people here. I don't know everybody completely well, so I would ask this, Lord, if there's anybody here that's had to say, you know, I don't know that I ever really accepted Christ is my Savior so He could be my Lord and I could live in the grace that He provides on a daily basis. Lord, I would ask that they don't leave this place until they settle that with You. Lord, they don't have to say anything to me or anybody or Lord, we'll be available if they want to. But just quietly, just themselves, one-on-one -on -one with You, Jesus, saying, I need You. I need You, Lord to spread your grace upon me and your salvation upon me. And Lord, their life will change. If everything's going good, it'll get a lot better. And if everything's going bad, it will change. It will get much better. So Lord, let your Holy Spirit do his work as we close. Lord, we will stop in just a moment and take a, an offering. Because it's a part of worship. Lord, when we, when we come to you and we take this offering, Lord, we're actually worshiping you in another manner. And I ask, Lord, you would bless those that could give as well as those that can't give. And as we do here almost every time, Lord, we pray that we give a few moments and let you pray about where God is taking you, what God would have you to give. And then you give accordingly. You give to whatever God's laid on your heart. If he said, don't give anything, don't give anything. But if he has stepped forward and said, God, if he stepped forward and he said, you give sacrificially, you give sacrificially.